in the world that is shrinking in terms of interest. So, the United States cannot say we do not have interest in Southeastern Europe because, well, Southeastern Europe is going to blow back into the face of the United States because the world is small. Well, Germany understands that very well. So, Germany was not just uh, being, uh, uh, being uh, charitable. Germany, uh, by accepting uh, 800,000 in half a year, was saving Europe from itself and its populism, too. Uh, well, is it going to backlash against Angela Merkel? Probably. So, but uh, this engagement uh, is certainly not uh, not uh, the way of uh, acting. So, say, uh, having said that, well, uh, we should protect protect more, well, say, weaker countries, weaker economy of the European Union. Uh, barbed wires are going to create effect of uh, of clogged poor countries. You have, in, in Europe, especially in the Western Balkans, you have countries at the verge of functionality. It, it is just a little bit needed to tip the balances up and, and see them again, well, in, in one or the other way of conflict. So, this is one thing. The, the, the other thing is, the United States has to share the burden because the United States has to help Europe not to uh, Ha not the same thing to happen. They, the tip of balance towards uh, some kind of crazy populism, uh, 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 which uh, which is already happening in, in Europe. Well, just look, France is the verge of uh, of Marine Le Pen uh, becoming a president. Well, uh, um, uh, well, almost in every European country, you have a growth of uh, of cheap populism, which offers no solutions. Yeah. It offers actually, uh, well, a big con. So, uh, so, uh, well, this is this is a time of uh, of a wake up call. So, someone has said, well, uh, uh, Andras, well, you said, well, about uh, the think tanks. So, well, that is, well. Uh, uh, well, because well, uh, uh, we don't like to to to, to, to hear the, the, the truth. But uh, uh, well, so much for me because uh, five minutes is. Uh, <laughs> 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 thank you. Can you me? Thank you. Thank you for having having me. Uh, I am on the, the the side of Nana, so I will try to really to shrink to shrink uh, uh, my speech as well. My body is what I said. So, uh, uh, sorry for the absent papers, but uh, I want to, to present some, some figures because I think that figures have to be the starting, the starting point. Uh, I will try uh, not to focus uh, only on refugees, many has been said, but I will try to raise a little bit uh, the, the view in a, in a different, uh, in a broader perspective, which is uh, uh, migrations per se and uh, why uh, it is absolutely a mistake uh, to see migrations only uh, from a securitarian point of view. On the contrary, we have to, to see migrations in different, uh, from different approaches, which is uh, something uh, for us Italians, I am Italian, is, is, is something uh, I think very interesting because we've been for, for uh, at least uh, one and a half centuries a country of, of uh, people who are migrating abroad, as it is very clear here in the, in the US, for our country, you know, how many Italian Americans that there are here. And uh, recently, uh, re recently, we discovered that we became an immigration uh, country, which, uh, uh, from the one hand, uh, obliged us to, to change our mindsets in, in terms of how to deal, but on the other hand, this also gave a footprint on how we dealt and we are dealing with it. Uh, many has been said, much has been said, I won't repeat things, but basically uh, uh, there are different kinds of migrations, uh, different kinds of reasons for people, for people migrating. You have the refugees, you have the economic migrants, and all these different flows of migrants require a different, uh, different approaches and different ways to deal with. Uh, for example, in Italy only so far in this year we had 105,000 people uh, arriving, arriving in Italy. Of course, it's difficult to deal with, 
But this is why, first of all, we had a humanitarian approach, and we, and we, we launched on a national basis an operation in the Mediterranean called the Mare Nostrum uh, RC, uh, by which we saved hundreds of thousands of lives uh, with our, with our uh, Navy forces. Then, then it turned into a, only then it turned into a, a new mission called UNAFOR, which not by chance is led by an Italian admiral, by the way. Uh, but on the, on the same hand, we, we, we explain to European uh, friends that this is not an Italian issue. This is a, a, an issue that has to deal with, uh, with, uh, with the whole uh, Then now I'll try to go a little bit broader. And that's why I, I give you some facts. Because we think, uh, as Italians, that immigrants, as Italian, as Italian immigrants, have been really a value, an added value to build up that the US as they are. Even President Obama said the US wouldn't have been what they are without the contribution of the Italian immigration. On the same hand, Italy is not, will not be as it was uh, following this, this increasing migration. So I'll give you just some, some, some figures, because uh, I think this will help us to see uh, migrations on a different perspective. Because now, as I said, we, we, we tend, or the public discourse tends to, to see migration only on a securitarian <coughs> point of view. How can we deal with the threat? And, uh, and our perspective is how can you deal with the added value, which is a, a different approach. For example, uh, today uh, in Italy, 8.8% of the national gross domestic product uh, accounts uh, from uh, immigrants uh, that are resident, uh, that are resident uh, in Italy. And not only, uh, let's say, uh, uh, law forces. We have uh, low-level uh, labor forces. We have companies. We have entrepreneurship. Uh, Italians tend, tended to go in neighboring countries, uh, also yours, to invest. Now we have people from, from your countries coming, uh, coming to invest, or for, for other countries coming, coming to invest. So this is, as I said, 8.8% of the GDP is accounted. It's difficult to make estimates, but these are, these are some figures that uh, are coming out. Uh, uh, Italy has a problem uh, of, uh, not people know that, but we have a, a very low uh, birth, uh, birth rate. And actually, uh, it's because of the presence of the immigrants that uh, we could somehow cope with this, uh, with this, uh, with these issues. And and uh, uh, the population is uh, largely due. The <coughs> population that we have is largely due uh, to uh, to the presence of, of new uh, new immigrants, because otherwise we would be in a negative trend, which is which is uh, something uh, relevant if you ca calculate that. From a point of view of fiscal responsibility and national pension reserves, it, it, it is estimated that foreign workers' contribution accounts for 5.2% of the total revenue, adding to the social development funds in Italy 8.9 billion euros in estimates uh, 2014. So in a time of demographic changes with the population aging and, and, and the, there is a burden, an economic burden on that, the presence of the, of, of the, 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 the immigrants and the, the foreigners working in Italy is providing a great, a great economic, uh, economic help, not only today, but also in terms of uh, sustainability. Because, as I said, the, the, the birth rate of the immigrant population is higher than, the, than, uh, than uh, let's say, the traditional Italian family. So this will uh, will economically help and will also shape a different society. As I said, I mean, as the, the West became what they are because of the influence of immigrants, also Italy, which was an immigration camp, and as an immigration camp, we, we have to to to, uh, to do with this. Uh, if you calculate that in 2014, 15 percent of all live births are estimated coming from uh, from immigrant uh, immigrants in Italy. So this is what this is the message I wanted to, to pass here today. We have to change the, the discourse on, on immigration uh, from a threat to a, a to an opportunity. Of course, there is the, the terrorist threat or, or, or whatever, but this is only a part of it. And actually, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is very difficult uh, to create a clear linkage between, uh, between the, the immigration, the flows of immigrations and, uh, and terrorism. Uh, so far, in Italy, we don't have uh, yet hard figures. There can be one or two, but we'll never say no one of them. But certainly, if you talk about 100, uh, 60,000 people coming this year, you don't have 160,000 terrorists in town, thanks God. So, so uh, I think that really the figures should be, should be uh, the facts should be uh, seen by figures, and we, we, we should make our efforts, and as 
Italian government and as Italian officials, we are trying to do so, to change the discourse on immigration, uh, raising uh, our, uh, our sight to what are some, some trends, some global trends that are, uh, that are, that are there. Uh, one can say it's good or bad, but they are there. You cannot, uh, you, you cannot uh, stop them, you can manage them, you can make it uh, a, a dual benefit for those who migrate in our country and those who receive the migrants in our country. So, so thank you, uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to uh, to be part of this uh, of this event. Uh, I'm with the World Bank, uh, which is a, a development organization. I think what, what we wanted to talk about is really this reconnecting uh, development to migration and within migration to the to the narrower focus of of forced displacement. Now, why is this important to us? Very simply because the forcibly displaced are today about 60 million people. That's about 1% of the world population. And if you add to that the community, communities that are receiving them, you're talking about a very sizable number of people who are affected by the, by the current global crisis. I think it's fairly clear that we, as an international community, will not be able to achieve the sustainable development goals that were agreed on in uh, New York last fall if we do not actually try to address this problem. The other point I wanted to make is that we're talking a lot about the European crisis, but there are about 60 million forcibly displaced people today, 40 million of which are IDPs, 20 million of which are refugees. Uh, out of the 60 million, over 57 million are living in developing countries. Over 57 million. So those who are bearing the brunt of the crisis are not the EU, are not the US. They are the Kenyas, they are the Ethiopia, they are the Lebanon, the Jordan, the Pakistans, the Irans, the Malis, the CAR, the Colombias, all of these countries, which are indeed uh, uh, developing countries. Uh, and clearly, like earlier speakers, I, mean, I think it's fairly uh, obvious uh, when we look at the crisis that are generating these flows of refugees, uh, that this is a crisis that's going to last. Uh, there's no end in sight, there's no credible or encouraging peace process uh, going on right now for those crises which are causing most of the most of the displacement, which are Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, the two Sudans, and then the Asia, Colombia, and so on. Now, we probably all agree that this is not only a humanitarian crisis, but this is also a development crisis. Is this well-known figure that protracted displacement on average lasts for 17 years? I think as, as uh, an earlier speaker was saying, 17 years. You arrive when you're five, it's over when you're 22. I mean, what does it mean in terms of your life, in terms of the possibility of return, in terms of the meaning of return? Uh, so I think, I think we, we all agree that at this stage, it is, you know, humanitarian assistance remains terribly important. And I think we're going to witness this once again this winter as we, as we continue to see this flow of people going to southeastern Europe. Uh, but at the same time, we have to come up with a, uh, with a development response. And this development response is not only more money to do humanitarian type of activities, it's also doing different uh, uh, activities. It's looking at these individuals as people who have acquired extra vulnerabilities because they're expensive for this placement. It's trying to figure out how we can help them mitigate this force, these additional vulnerabilities so that they can, quote unquote, normalize uh, themselves. It's also looking at the host communities, which are essentially receiving a, a shock when large numbers of people flow in, and try to see with them how to make the best uh, out of this, uh, uh, out of this uh, experience. So um, I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, we at the World Bank are. Uh, um, Increasing our involvement in this area, as some of you may know, the issue of forced displacement, of forced displacement is a pillar of our strategy for the Middle East. But we obviously also have a number of regional initiatives in the Great Lakes, in the Horn of Africa, and in many of these uh, regions where there is a combination of origin and, and host countries. Uh, but I just wanted to add, uh, um, and, and I know that we're short of time, so I'm trying to be, uh, uh, to be very short. I, I just wanted to make to make one point that I think it's striking when you um, uh, when you start looking at this uh, development issue, 
uh, how much of the discussions are actually uh, based on prejudices rather than facts. And I'm talking about uh, the xenophobic prejudices that, that we've been talking about. Um, but I think more generally, there's, there's a lack of data, a lack of evidence uh, to kind of drive uh, decision making. And, and when we look, when one, once you, you start looking for facts, it's a very complex and nuanced picture that's, uh, that's uh, starting to emerge. Uh, and just, you know, just to give a few examples to, to illustrate this, um, we tried to do some analytical work in Turkey on the impact of the arrival of Syrian refugees on the labor market. You know, in other words, are the Syrians stealing the jobs of the Turks, right, to put it very bluntly. And the answer is very nuanced, right? The answer is that actually some categories of people are indeed displaced by uh, refugees. These are essentially low-skilled women who are working in the informal sector, uh, while other categories are actually benefiting from the inflow of refugees. These are basically the people who can benefit from the uh, increase in demand. So it's not a black and white picture, but it's a picture where you have groups that lose out and groups that <coughs> win, and therefore, you know, that calls for a certain number of policies to be put in place to try to support those who lose out and obviously try to make the best of, of the uh, extra growth. Uh, similarly, in Mali, we try to look at who's living and who's staying. And what's very interesting is to see that the, the first people to leave were essentially largely, and obviously this has to be nuanced, but were largely the uh, urban trading elites. Uh, now, imagine that the urban trading elites leave a region, then obviously it has a huge economic impact for all those who stay uh, and who no longer have functioning markets to sell their, their products, uh, their uh, uh, goods, or, 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 or camel milk. Uh, and that in turn, in, in turn precipitates uh, uh, further development. Uh, I think you know, we've done a, an assessment of the poverty of the Syrian refugees living in Jordan, and what's also striking is that somewhat counterintuitively, the low skills seem to do better than the higher skills. Yeah. Um, because they have more opportunities in the black market for, for fairly low skilled uh, uh, workers. Uh, and I think the, the ambassador was talking about return, and you know, in the previous session we heard a lot about return, but uh, in Colombia, uh, only 11% of the IDPs are expressing a desire to return. 89% are expressing no desire to return. Right? So my sense, our sense, is that it's actually quite important to look at the numbers, as, as, uh, as someone said before, and to try to really ground our work and our support when it's about this development support that has to be undertaken over, over an extended period of time, to run it in, in facts and in evidence. In evidence on what the problem is, but also in evidence on what works, what doesn't work, in trying to be a little bit rigorous in, in assessing the impact of the various operations and various projects uh, that we are undertaking, to indeed really be in a position to, uh, to help these people. I think there, there have been lots of talks about uh, the potential boon of, or the potential benefits that Germany could get from this, uh, from these one million people uh, who have arrived uh, this year. I think the one million refugees arrived the day before yesterday. Uh, uh, it's obviously uh, an, ex an extraordinary potential uh, for growth, but only to the extent that we clearly know who these people are, and therefore that we put in place the type of policies that they need to be integrated or to be included in, in society. So I just wanted to, to stop there. Uh, uh, this is obviously a huge agenda crisis that's, that's going to, to last, unfortunately. Uh, um, and I think I very, very much welcome the opportunity, uh, not only to, to address this assembly, but also to, to, to make the point that we, whether it's think tanks, humanitarians, diplomats, uh, development uh, workers, really need to work together to make sure that we can address it uh, effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, about 15 years ago, I remember sitting in a room very similar to this one next door at the Brookings Institution, uh, where the president, then president of the World Bank, James Wilkinson, and the then High Commissioner for Refugees, Sadako Ogata, uh, convened the first sort of real serious public discussion about the relief to development continuum or the Relief to Development Gap, as some call it. Uh, it was almost exactly 15 years ago, and yet I feel that it's really only now 
that institutions and the academics and uh, the practitioners are really beginning to come to grips with how to narrow that gap and uh, how to, uh, to treat displaced people as not only the bearers of needs, but also the bearers of talents and energies, uh, people who have uh, economic contributions to make. Um, it's only taken 15 years, that's maybe fairly <laughs> fast for, uh, for development um, theories and, and practices to change, but it certainly is high time. At the same time, I think uh, one of the, the sort of false premises that underlay the beginning of that conversation, which I hope we've abandoned, is the idea that development is somehow a cure for migration. And if we can just get the development of, uh, part of it right, that people won't feel called upon to move, or that people won't move. Um, that is, there's no empirical evidence to support that. It may seem sort of logical, but in fact what we know about the relationship between migration and development is that as development accelerates, people are more able to move, and more likely to move, and have greater connections with, uh, with other countries that attract them to move. But, of course, there's a huge difference in moving in response to opportunity and moving in response to threat and, um, and violence. And uh, that is the, the state in which we aspire to, is that people move in response to opportunity rather than threat. In the, in the current situation, countries that host refugees in particular have a tendency only to count the costs of hosting refugees and, and don't really like to admit that there are also benefits. Um, and I was very pleased um, to hear uh, our uh, colleague from the Italian embassy acknowledging that there are also benefits that, uh, that come from these inflows. And even in the, even in the emergency phase, um, See, for example, the textile industry in Turkey being really revitalized uh, by the influx of skilled artisans from Syria's uh, legendary textile industry. There are both winners and losers from these kinds of flows. And in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey, the most heavily burdened countries, landlords benefit, the rise in demand for housing, rents have risen. Uh, farmers benefit with the tremendous availability of people who are willing to work for very low wages um, in, in almost any capacity. Um, so there, there are winners as well as losers. Those who lose, as was mentioned, are mostly the poor. And for that reason, I think it's tremendously important for uh, humanitarian actors as well as development actors to invest in those, those communities and uh, to try to make sure that uh, the, those who, whose livelihoods are uh, endangered by the arrival of competitors at the low end of the labor market are not, uh, are not damaged, that the social infrastructure and physical infrastructure keep up with the demands that are increased by the arrival of refugees. Beyond that, I think it's um, very important, as I think Manal mentioned at the very beginning, that, that we shift the paradigm of how we think about uh, mass inflows uh, from focusing solely on the burdens to focusing on opportunities. And I think it's useful in that sense to think about uh, short-term and medium-term and long-term responses to these flows. The short-term response, of course, has to be humanitarian, plucking people out of the sea, as the Italians did so heroically and in such a lonely way for a long time. And that has been one of the real success stories in the last year, is that people are not dying at sea at nearly the rate at which they did in previous years, because Italy has been joined by 14 or 15 other countries in deploying assets in the Mediterranean to save people. But then once they're saved, then what happens? In the medium term, the, integrate, the challenge is for integration. And that really uh, requires 
a lot of investment in, particularly in the first instance in language training, because probably nothing makes more difference to people's ability to integrate in a new country than the ability to speak the language. And none of our countries in Europe or in North America have uh, the capacity for language training, especially for adults, that is needed to cope with the kind of numbers we're looking at now. But beyond that, broader education training uh, and employment is what is going to make the difference between a successful experience of, of large-scale inflow and one that uh, places great strains on both public and private resources. In the long term, if the, if the medium term, if the integration challenge is met successfully, then the long term impact of these flows is likely to be uh, very positive. And uh, we've seen much of private industry in Europe uh, acknowledging, um, I think the, the, uh, the CEO of Mercedes-Benz said that he expects these inflows at this period to be the basis for Germany's third economic miracle. Mm. And uh, Mercedes is recruiting in the refugee shelters for people to join their uh, apprenticeship programs and so on. And other <coughs> German companies are as well, and I'm sure that's happening in other countries uh, that face the same kind of uh, demographic uh, challenges um, that um, that uh, we, we heard about earlier. The final, um, uh, final thought is that the economic benefit uh, of these flows in the long term will not only be for the countries that are receiving refugees and migrants, but also for the countries of origin. And this we've seen time after time uh, with uh, diaspora populations of refugee origin or of, or of migrants that give back to their countries in very substantial ways, and not only in terms of remittances, although remittances are huge, uh, even and sometimes especially in uh, communities that are affected by conflict and violence. They are a real lifeline. If you look at refugee camps in Nepal for uh, the uh, uh, Bhutanese who were ethnically cleansed from Bhutan, they were surrounded by a ring of Western Union offices and money gram offices of people receiving uh, vital support from relatives and friends abroad. Um, so there's that, that sort of short-term effect of remittances that sort of can keep people going. But in the longer term, investment, trade ties, um, mentorship, the ability to study with people. I'm sure that um, that the long-term experience with Syria will not be unlike that of Vietnam, which now sees 7% of its GDP coming back in the form of remittances, as well as the, um, the, the trade and investment um, that is really helping to transform that economy. So I think the long-term picture is bright. The, Short-term and medium ones are tremendously uh, challenging, but um, as Angela Merkel has said famously, we can manage. <laughs>
uh, migrants coming in, refugees coming in. Uh, I think you have some magic there. I wonder if you're willing to share it. <laughs> I'm going to take the second question. I think she's going to give me the mic, so we'll go back there, and that will be the only question for the yes. panel. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. For this if you could stand, please. Yes. Uh, no, I'm, I'm the director of the Visual Communication. It means, uh, out of these 150,000 people that I was mentioning in 2015, uh, almost, uh, almost uh, 38,000 were from Eritrea, then 20,000 from Nigeria, then 11,000 from Somalia, and then Sudan, etc. So, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, that there are different flows. There are different flows of immigrants. Basically, I think there is also a regional uh, dimension. <clears throat> this is why uh, the, the operation in Mediterranean is so important, because uh, the, uh, and then I will go to, I relate to, to the other question. Uh, people who are migrating uh, across the sea uh, are basically people who are, uh, in our case at least, uh, escaping from uh, economic situations, dire situations, war situations, etc. Uh, uh, so this is why, even if they board from Libya, they are not Libyans. There, 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 is a, there is a whole line coming from, from the sub-Saharan uh, 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 sub Africa and Horn of Africa, and then they board, they, they board in Libya because it's closed and because Unfortunately, there is not a, a, a border control or a, or a seashore control currently in Libya. So, this is why when we talk about uh, the, the issue of Libya, it's, it's quite a broader question rather than only the situation in the country itself. Uh, to, to the first question, uh, there is no, no magic, unfortunately, and, and uh, we don't have anything uh, to teach to our, to our American friends. The only thing I say is that, and, and, and nor am I uh, we're an expert in, uh, in anti-terrorism, what I say is that uh, terrorists tend to not, not to use this kind of, of, of ways to enter the, for the simple reason that they have a completely different object, uh, objective. Those who are trying uh, uh, to save their lives and come, and come to Italy, or whatever it is, at the end of the story they want to be saved, they want to be, they, they want to be taken uh, on shore, to be identified, and to be uh, housed and, 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 and helped to build a different, uh, a different life. Uh, I have some doubts that a, a terrorist wants to be taken, uh, identified, uh, and having his fingerprints <laughs> taken, etc. Et so uh, this is why I think that uh, um, uh, one has to study a little bit things, and you will see that there is a reason why, uh, why this is not the major way. And then, uh, but this goes to sociologics, and it's, it's, not, it's not my, my First point: uh, If you see some of the less, more terrible terrorist attacks, were maybe carried out by second, uh, second generation, third generation. So th this brings us to to, uh, to a whole uh, um, another bunch of, of uh, discussion that goes more from, from those who spoke about the long-term issues rather than the immediate immediate uh, immigration flows. Thank you. <laughs> If I could just add on that, on the, the sort of terrorist, sorry, the terrorist threat ari arising from sort of refugee flows. Uh, as you're all aware, I'm sure the, the program, the refugee program that has been uh, uh, most under attack in uh, recent weeks since the Paris bombing has been the refugee resettlement program. And the, the tremendous irony is, of course, that that is the most scrutinized, most heavily vetted stream of people who come into the United States under any immigration program. They go through five independent layers of security screening before they are allowed to come here. And um, uh, echoing uh, Xavier's uh, call for more evidence and more evidence-based policy making, um, I looked at the number of refugees resettled since 9-11 when these security protocols were really ramped up. And since then, we have resettled 784,000 refugees in the United States. And there have been three or four arrests of resettled refugees on terrorism-related grounds. None of those ha tiny handful of people Came, were able to come anywhere close to executing their plans before they were picked up by the FBI. And only one person was um, even talking about planning an attack in the United States. So the, the risks 
the security risks from refugee resettlement are really vanishingly small. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, a special thanks to the panelists because we cut your time so short, and you know, obviously with the audience we weren't able to ask so many questions. Um, it was you know, very useful, I think we began to shift the framing, um, pointing out that the global world is very small, there's no country that can't um, escape this, and also really beginning to give very tangible, I mean the Mercedes example, the birth rate, and how migrants are actually helping societies. Um, on the question of security, you know, I keep emphasizing when we're looking at migration, there, there really is, um, you know, a challenge. The moment we let security, the moment we let security guide our moral compass, we will always be led astray. And it's really important that we remember the values that we built this country and a lot of civilized countries that we are um, proud to be from on. Thank you. Thank you.